Now, this is a guy, Mike Benz, who is a CIA expert. And I did a piece on him with some stuff, some information he provided a couple months ago. Because I don't know if you if you follow like guys like Rob Reiner or Sean Penn on uh, on on Twitter, they're very like pro Democratic Party politics. They're very shit libby. And uh, Mike Benz kind of broke into and explained. If you haven't seen this piece, go back and watch it. How they are all funded by CIA NGOs. So like Rob Reiner is on sits on the board of this like CIA funded NGO that John Brennan and a couple other former CIA uh, clapper are on. Um, so that, you know, it's Hollywood and the CIA are and the military are, are deeply intertwined. Um, but watch this clip of Mike kind of breaking down. This is kind of long, but I think it's, I think it's worth it just because it, and he goes into detail about the different agencies and everything, but uh, it's it's uh, it's the history of how they do this. And, and just just listen to him. He, this guy is really brilliant. Cheney clip posted by Representative Dan Bishop, and it had her describing Trump's run for president in 2024 as potentially the last election in American history. This echoes a long line. The last election in America, the, the most important election of our life. Foreign policy establishment, apex predators, who are all now suddenly in unison championing this framing of Trump as a dictator, as an authoritarian. This is obviously stuff they've recycled from before. But it Just a quick aside. You may or may not remember this, but Robert Reich floated Liz Cheney as a potential Democratic Party political candidate just to give you an idea how neoconned the Democrats are. It's all sort of converging right now. And, you know, this attack on democracy, dictator, authoritarian thing. And especially this framing of it being the last election if we don't stop it. Now, you have to recognize the trick here and go all the way back to the beginning. The framing techniques they're using right now are the same ones used in 1948 at the very dawn of the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency to create a predicate for dirty tricks. And I'll talk about what those dirty tricks are going to be, but just a quick history lesson here. Uh, the, the CIA was created under the Nas 1947 National Security Act, and the very first thing World it World did to rig an election overseas was to rig the 1948 Italian election, which was the first democratic election after World War II, you know, after Mussolini had been, had been gored, and, and suddenly Italy was torn between a Euro-Atlanticist, Western-backed political candidate for president, and a Soviet-backed, communist-sympathetic president, and the and the Central Intelligence Agency, which one the U.S. from chose. the State Department, and certain private interests, and and certain interests within Italy itself, ranging from the Sicilian mob, who the, our our national security state had partnered with because they were persecuted by by Mussolini, so the so so Italian street muscle was used as a sort of uh, makeshift resistance movement within Italy. We kept those networks. With, with the with the underground and with so it's funny because just a quick aside our foreign policy is our domestic policy what he's talking about here with us funding like insurgents we this is what the 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 deep state or the you know the intelligence u.s intelligence does and has done repeatedly for years we funded isis in the middle east so we could fight them they funded hamas in Israel so they could fight them. We are we funded the insurgents in the Ukraine so Putin would invade and we could fight them. And so this is what they do. He's telling you when Mussolini was in charge in Italy, we funded the Italian mafia because they were in opposition to Mussolini. Media institutions and propaganda institutions, we we bribed, cajoled, stuffed ballot boxes, the whole the whole dirty dirty works that you could possibly do. And uh, George Kennan wrote, he's one of the godfathers of the CIA, he wrote a memo after this happened. It's called The Inauguration of Organized Political Warfare, published later that year, 1948, where he explains the logic of it and, and basically you know, writes a letter essentially to the intelligence community saying, listen, we're in the, we're in the business of dirty tricks now after World War II has, has, uh, has, uh, has ended because if we don't do dirty tricks, the Bolsheviks will, and these dirty tricks work. And he goes on. 
if we're not evil, someone else will out evil us. On to explain that the, the, the problem was is if the communist candidate had won the presidency there in Italy, then there would be no elections in Italy again, possibly. So we had to rig this one. We had to stuff ballot boxes. We had to work with the mob to bust up any uh, any pro-Soviet uh, meetings that were happening in Italy. We had to save democracy. We had to use street muscle. We had to go dirty, dirty, dirty using CIA tricks to rig the election because it might be the last election ever if we don't. So it was a predicate used to establish a protocol around doing things that you're not normally allowed to do in an election cycle if someone poses an existential threat to you know the the, the system of of governance that they call democracy now we saw this happen in 2020 for example the transition integrity project which was this uh you know 65 person hugely influential group of people so there was a <clears throat> There was a Time Magazine article about this called like the plot to save the election or whatever, where they go into detail about how all these corporate donors and political leaders and people in the security state got together to subvert Trump. And again, that tells someone like me that Trump would be a good thing and is a good thing because these people don't want to lose their power. And these are the people who have brought the country to where it's at today, which is not a good place. This included Donna Brazil, the former head of, of the DNC, Michael Steele, the former head of the RNC. So the two most recent heads of both major political parties, as well as about 60 some officials from the Department of both Defense, the Department of State, parties. the intelligence community, and then other cluster networks around everything from journalism to, uh, to, to champions of industry. And they had a role play simulation about how to overturn the 2020 election. This is Listen in June 2020 five months before the election happened, about how they could overturn the election if Trump won to save democracy and make sure that he would not be able to have a second term. This is, they had simulation three, I've posted this a million times, but I'll put it in the thread below. Sim, they did four simulations. In simulation number three, John Podesta personally played a role-playing role of Joe Biden. John Podesta, who was Hillary Clinton's campaign manager and now runs the largest pot of money in the entire federal government, a $370 billion slush fund. So again, this is what they do in other countries. Foreign policy is domestic policy now. Now they're doing it here to subvert elections here. And whether you like Trump or not, they're going to do it to someone you do like once you do get someone like a Bernie Sanders. They did it to Bernie Sanders. They did this shit to Bernie Sanders. When you listen to him laying this out, too, I guarantee you there was some of this behind a certain protest that happened after Trump was voted out that has like really shady origins and has a lot of, you know, military and police you know, undercovers involved and we're not allowed to see all the footage of it because we might out some like secret cops and stuff. It sounds very familiar to what he's kind of outlining here. For energy project projects, he personally role played the role of Joe Biden. And what did they do? It was in this role play. It was dirty tricks. The, the simulation went as follows. If Trump won a, a quote, clear victory at the electoral college, but had lost the popular vote, they were going to mobilize Black Lives Matter street muscle. They wrote this, mobilize Black Lives Matter street muscle and use their anger to, to essentially become a pro-Biden, a narco-tyranny force that would shut down the country as a color revolution does in Serbia or in Tunisia or as the CIA organizes abroad. Who was the head of the Transition Integrity Project, by the way? It was, uh, it was a woman named Rosa Brooks, who was a former high-ranking Pentagon don't you love these Orwellian named NGOs? The Transition Integrity Project? Yeah, that's like, a, like it's literally the opposite of what it is. Official, who in her own book talks about how she had a CIA blue badge. That's a real organization too. Man, I think some, it, like all these weird, you know, CIA cutouts like CISA, CISA, and all these like censorship organizations, same thing. Which allows you to access essentially the inner sanctum of the CIA and is currently sort of masquerading as a, 
maybe that's too strong a word, but is, Listen, is currently employed as a professor of democratization studies at Georgetown, which if you know what that means, that means she teaches courses on how to overthrow governments. A professor of democratization studies. Even the word democracy has an Orwellian twinge to it now because democracy means situations where these assholes control everything and the voters don't actually have a say. And that's why Trump was such an anomaly. He wasn't supposed to win. I mean, they they did everything they could to rig that election for Hillary, including the Democratic primary. And she still lost. And that was when, and you saw this so clearly because I, I volunteered on Bernie's campaign in 2016 and 2020. And in 2020, the amount of censorship uh, uh, on social media was ratcheted up to the next level. And the conspiracy head in me goes, oh, that's why they locked us all down and forced us onto social media so there couldn't be any kind of protests or organizations at the DNC once they kicked Bernie out of the race. Anyway, let me let Mike finish here. because Now, as we know, there, from the Time Magazine article that came out just weeks after the election, uh, it turned out that the Chamber of Commerce had a, had a deal struck with the AFL-CIO, which used to be called the AFL-CIA by, uh, by, by folks back in the 1960s because of how closely it worked with the Central Intelligence Agency as street muscle for overthrowing foreign countries as what happened in Poland with the trade unions there under Lech Walesa and in many other countries, but I'll save that for another time. The Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO came to a mutual agreement for a stand down of the destabilizing protests they had planned if Trump had won the election. The Time Magazine article stipulates this. Now, wouldn't you know the Chamber of Commerce and, and the- There you go. That goes back to what I said about a certain protest that happened after Trump lost to Biden. The, and the, the unions are two of the four stools of the National Endowment for Democracy, which has four branches. The National Democratic Institute, which is for basically Democrat Party payoffs on foreign policy initiatives. The International Republican Institute, which is for Republican Party payoffs on international initiatives. The Center for International Private Enterprise, which is the Chamber of Commerce wing of the CIA cutout. And the Solidarity Center, which is the which is the street muscle uh, labor union wing of the uh, of the the CIA cutout, known as the National Endowment for Democracy. So you had this these blob creatures in charge of these destabilization plans. We know that the same way these kind of destabilization protests to shut down the ability to govern are done by our national security state abroad. It happened to have an identical structure in 2020. And it was all done on this predicate that if we don't stop this now, if this man, even even if he wins fair and square, the country won't be normal after. You know, there will be the last election ever. The same phrasing they used to justify rigging the Italian election in 1948. This is the predicate to set up those same Department of Dirty Tricks again. So I thought that was real interesting because as we've seen in this country, our domestic and foreign policy are identical. Um, they're doing the same shit here to us now that they did in the Middle East. Uh, I think it was Matt Gates. In fact, I have a clip of this somewhere um, talking about how after the war on terror ended, they turned the all that. There's budgets and they you know, if you know anything about budgets, you want more money. You got to have a reason. So they turn that inwards towards domestic terror. And now that's why you see all these uh, these masked dudes in matching khakis protesting as Nazis and no reporter ever bothers to get their name or, you know, do a like a deep dive into who they are or how they're organizing. Like these guys are supposedly massive threats to the country. And you see it all the time. I've seen it on social media. I don't watch mainstream news, but I'm sure they cover it. You know, you see these marches of dudes with like upside down flags and they've all got matching khakis and they just march in single file lines through like really public places but no one in the press ever bothers to go like oh yeah these guys are they call them patriot front but no one ever goes like hey that you know here's the leader of patriot front and who he is there's no intrepid journalist digging into that and that's it's very suspicious when you look at it you know they, they there was a protest where they had a bunch of guys zip tied in idaho for protesting a gay pride march or something and it's just uh when you hear stuff like this and you and 
guys like Mike that have this kind of knowledge go through the history of this stuff. It's it's just very evident unless you're a totally naive, you know, simp what's going on. So, 